Thank you, Alisan. Thank you, Praise Band. Oh, thank everyone for coming out this morning. Exciting. Exciting. I, I was listening to Praise Band practice before service. I actually got a little teary. And uh, getting able to, being able to sit down there with my wife this morning rather than just being up here and, and having someone come and pray, it's just uh, wonderful. I feel like things are slowly getting back to normal. And that is something to be uh, praising God for. I'm thankful to Valerie Restarted Team Kid, which is our discipleship program for kids during the church service, and she has two other ladies who are helping her, so they're each taking two weeks at a time, so she gets to be in here in the sanctuary with me, and I get to sit by her again um, uh, four out of six weeks, and that's exciting, even when she takes the sermon outline, and she flips it over, and then flips it back, and flips it over, and flips it back and looks at me. But, but it's, it's, there's another added advantage to having her sitting with me because I have my own personal uh, groomer and dresser. Because apparently this is okay, and this is okay, but this is not okay. So Now if I had a mirror up here, I suppose I could do something about that. So I'm trying very hard to have it one way or the other. But we are in Galatians 4. 12 through 20 this morning, and we're going to talk about leading in love. And in, in, case, in case you're um, thinking, well, I'm not a leader, I'm not a head of a, you know, I'm not a, head of a business, I don't uh, work in a significant capacity in the church, I just pray and help out when I can, well, instead of leading in love, perhaps then think of living in love. Because the qualities we're going to be talking about this morning do dovetail very well with leadership, particularly because we're talking about Paul and his leadership as the missionary and kind of the starter of the church in Galatia. But 
the qualities go beyond leadership. And we need to not only lead in love, we need to live in love. And in in reading the passage of Scripture this morning, I'm actually going to read out of the New King James. Now, I I use the ESV. It's kind of the popular popular Bible version for evangelicals. And um, it's a good translation. I like the underlying text behind the New King James a little better, but I'm willing to use the ESV and make changes as I see fit. Um, But this is a translation issue this morning. The ESV is exactly the same text, but translates it a little differently and uses a different term than the word zeal. And I think the word zeal is very important in our understanding of this passage. So I'm reading it out of the New King James this morning. Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in the flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you so much for what you have done for us through Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the example of Paul here. And pray, Lord, that we will learn to lead in love and live in love as a result of your word today. And Lord, we know that none of this is possible without Jesus Christ's sacrificial death on the cross for our sins. That when we believe in him, we have your spirit come and reside in us. And then we can lead and live in love. So I pray, Lord, for anyone who may be here who has not yet taken that step of faith. I pray that you will open the eyes of their hearts even as you help us as we look at your word. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Now, we've got kind of five points of explanation and three points of application that we're going to go through as we look at the passage. And the first point of explanation is this. We recognize Paul's ongoing love for the church. It's it's readily evident here in this passage. He is concerned about them. He's flabbergasted. He calls them brothers. He sees himself as their spiritual mother. He wants them to mature. He wants to make sure that they truly understood about Jesus Christ. That's why he's fearful for them. He he loves them, and he cares about them. And it might not have been readily apparent at the beginning of the letter. We talked about how this was probably Paul's first letter he's written. And it's the only letter he wrote that doesn't have some type of thanksgiving in it. Some have speculated that that's because it was his first letter, and he's kind of getting his style, um, uh, uh, trying to figure out how he's supposed to write and what he's supposed to write. But if the Holy Spirit is actually leading him, you would think that if he was supposed to write differently, he would have written differently. I think the issue here is that this is such an important problem that, that it's not just some little point of doctrine. This is the gospel. This is about salvation. And people have come into the church and they have said, no, no, what, what Paul said is fine. That's the way you start with God. But if you want to continue to get with God, if you want to really be saved, then you have to keep the Jewish law. And Paul is saying that is not true. Here, He is showing us once again that his hardness at the beginning of the letter isn't because he doesn't care. It's because he cares so much. And we see that care spilling out here. Brothers, I urge you to become like me. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you. 
This is not a hard taskmaster here. This is someone who is concerned, who cares very deeply, and he is writing this whole letter out of love. So here we recognize and we're reminded of Paul's ongoing love for the church. And Paul reminds the Galatians again that Jesus is enough. Someone uh, wrote me an email this week and said that that was resonating in their mind, and I, I appreciate that. It was a reminder to them that it's all about Jesus. And Paul here is saying, once again, that Jesus is enough. He says, look to my example. I became like you, and now you need to become like me. And what he means when he says, I became like you, was that he, he had the law. And he recognizes that now it's all about grace. In fact, if anyone could glory or trust in the law, it would have been Paul. This is what we read in Philippians 3, verses 4 through 6. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul's saying, if anyone could be saved by the law, it would have been me. But then he goes on and says this, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Because the law could show you you'd done wrong, but the law couldn't save you. You stand guilty before the law. The only way you can remove that burden of guilt, the only way you can have a right relationship with God, the only way you can be forgiven of your sinfulness and the wrong that you have done is through Jesus Christ. And Jesus is enough. Paul's saying, don't turn to the law now. The law can't save. It's all about grace. Once again, he reminded them, you receive the Spirit through grace, not through the law. Jesus is enough. And the reminder for us as believers is that, yes, we're supposed to still follow God and do good things, but we aren't doing them in order to somehow make sure that we're right with God and we can be saved. We are already saved. And what we do, we do now out of love for God and a desire to follow Him because He has put His Holy Spirit into our hearts and into our lives. We want to follow, but it doesn't make our salvation dependent upon whether or not we do follow. It's all about Jesus. It's all about grace. And then Paul goes on to remind them of their love for him. Once again, going back to our text, Brothers, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So Paul came to them in weakness, and there's all kinds of discussion about what this weakness could have been. Maybe he had been persecuted before this point, and he came there with some physical marks of the persecution on his body, and he, he wasn't at full strength, and they had to help him and maybe even nurse him back to health. Some have speculated that he had eye problems, in particular because he said, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. I think um, certainly a possibility. We certainly don't know for sure, but I think that might just be uh, almost an expression as to how much they cared for him. Not literally that he had an eye problem, but they would have even plucked out their eyes. They would have torn off their ears. They would have given him an arm. They would have done anything in order to help him. And most think he was sick in some way when he was there. So it wasn't eye problem specifically. It wasn't a result of persecution. He just was sick. And it was a trial to them. Did they have to care for him? Did they have to help him? Uh, was it difficult to listen to him? You know, were there some things going on in his body when he tried to speak that it was difficult? Or, or some have even said that maybe it was not so much 
a burden because of physical issues for them, but spiritual and emotional issues. In other words, you know, there's a kind of underlying idea in our society today, in society in general, particularly in Jewish society and even in Roman society, that if you are right with God or gods in the Roman society, then things will be good for you in life. You know, you will be happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise. And here is Paul, and he's none of those things when he's before them, and yet they still listen to him. They show him grace, in a sense. They don't reject him. In fact, they receive him with joy. Joy. Even though he was struggling and suffering. And I think that's one way we see that the Spirit was at work in them. Once again, returning to John 16, 6 through 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus says, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to me. But if I go, I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Paul says, there was no reason you should have received my testimony. I was sick. You cared for me. You listened to me. And that's all because God's Holy Spirit was working in them so that they would receive his message. And this, in a sense, this whole connection between listening and the Spirit is made more explicit in 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 3 through 6. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Here Paul is connecting the preaching and the spirit and the reception and even affliction or suffering. Very similar to what we have here in Galatians. Well, Paul goes on and encourages them to reject the false teachers. He says this in Galatians 4, 16 and 17. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. So first of all, Paul is wondering if they will choose the false teaching over his teaching. You know, is he going to become their enemy? Because he's pointing out that they're going away from the gospel. They're turning to another gospel, which he says is not another of the same kind. It's something completely different. You're going from grace to works. You receive the gospel in grace. Why are you turning to works? Why are you thinking that your salvation somehow depends on you? That your salvation somehow depends on your ability to work for God? He says it's wrong. And Paul here is concerned that they are choosing the false teaching over his teaching. He doesn't want to be their enemy. He's their friend. He cares. He loves. He has compassion. It's one of the reasons he starts off so, so strong, because they have to realize how big a deal this is. And Paul also points out that the false teachers have wrong motives. I made a typo there. It's not false teacher, but false teachers have wrong motives. Motives. They zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, pull you away from the faith that Paul has been preaching, that the other apostles have been preaching, so that you may be zealous for them. They aren't concerned about God. They're concerned about themselves and their own reputations and getting the praise of men. And this should remind us of what Jesus said about the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verses 3 through 7. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They make make their appearance 
a particular way so that you will think they were holy, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greeting in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. So there's an issue. They're only concerned about themselves. They're not really concerned about God, and so they're certainly not concerned about you, except in the sense of what you can do for them. And this has been a constant problem in the church. And we, we find this in the book of Jude, and Jude is basically written about false teachers and false teaching. You know, he, he starts off by saying, I wanted to write to you about our common salvation, but I have to write you about these people that have crept into the church. And in Jude 17 through 19, we read this. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. And I think if you were to ask Paul how to describe these false teachers in a way different than he's been doing, he might use those exact words. People who cause divisions, worldly people, because they're concerned about their own fame and their own glory, and they are devoid of the Spirit, devoid of the Spirit, because they are preaching law and not grace. And Paul reminds them that zeal is important, but that it needs to be for God and for grace. Galatians 4:18. But it is a good thing to be zealous, or it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you. Now I'm going to connect here the idea of zeal. Uh, Christian zeal with love for God. And love for God, we're reminded by Jesus Christ, is the greatest commandment. Mark 12, 30. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And this idea of love or Christian zeal can be coupled with feelings, of course, but it can also be coupled with commitment, a desire to follow and to serve God. So this idea of love and this idea of zeal isn't just this passionate feeling you have. It's followed up by obedience and service. That is a part of love. That is a part of zeal, wanting to follow God. And the reason I say that Paul reminds them that zeal is important, but it needs to be for God and for grace is because without grace, we couldn't know God. Um, Paul says this in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We can only know God through his grace. If God had not sent Jesus Christ to this earth to die on a cross for our sins, we could not have a relationship with him. And we would be go to a place of punishment, a place called hell for all eternity because of our own wicked deeds, because of our own sinfulness, because of our own selfishness, because of our own wrong. God is holy and perfect and righteous. And the smallest thing we do, Scripture says, is enough to keep us away from him. So the only way we can have a relationship with him is to be forgiven. And that forgiveness comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is offered to us through grace. And we are saved through our faith in him. And Paul wants them to remain faithful even when he's not there. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you. Or Paul's kind of chiding them. I mean, it's, it's in love, obviously, but he's still kind of chiding them here. So, I was there... You believed what I said, everything was great, but then I go away and everything goes to pot. All right? It's like having little kids. That's, I think, one of the reasons he also calls himself their, their mother. I mean, I'm like a spiritual mother to you. And the minute I leave the house, you go and get in the cookie jar. What is wrong with you people? Okay? But, but that's the kind of idea. He wants them to be faithful even when he's not there. And this... this idea of remaining faithful to the apostles' teaching is, is prevalent throughout Scripture. The one that popped into my mind was Hebrews 2.1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. 
We don't want to drift away, and we certainly don't want to turn away. And what the Galatians were in danger of doing is actually turning away. So that's kind of the, the passage in a nutshell. And what are some of the, the lessons that this passage teaches us about leading in love, about living in love? Well, first of all, leading in love does require confrontation. I mean, that's something that is not popular in today's society. The idea is if you love somebody, you just let them do whatever they want and you never confront them. But that is not what Scripture continually teaches us, both for the leaders in church or for the fellowship within the Christian body. Uh, we're reminded once again, Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. And there's a theological reason behind that. He quoted a passage from the Old Testament. But it's kind of interesting that, well, is it today? Well, every day is today. Well, then exhort one another because it is today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We are called upon to challenge one another. You know, it, it, it's a basic fundamental purpose of Christian fellowship. I mean, we, we like to think about the, the care and compassion and prayer and love and support, but allowing someone to sabotage their relationship with God through their own sinfulness is not love. It's not love. We are called upon to help one another. And one of the basic ways we help one another is by encouraging one another in our relationship with the God we know, the God we love, the God we serve, the God who died on the cross for us. Love does sometimes require confrontation. I mean, in all honesty, if, if you've had children at home, you understand this. You know, you, you want your kids to grow up to be the best they can be. And you want them certainly to have a relationship with God. But you have to confront them about the things that they do wrong. Not just the things that are sin, but the things that will affect them in society as a whole. To help them to understand that there is a proper way that they have to live. And there's a lot of dovetailing between the two. I mean, you know, we're not supposed to steal in society. We're not supposed to steal according to the Word of God. And those are the types of things you try and teach. And you do it because you love. Leading in love, living in love, does require confrontation. And that's why I, I think some preaching is devoid of spirituality in this day and age. Because some ministers are not willing to say anybody has done wrong. That anything is sin that there are problems in our culture and in society, and that our culture and society is actually the opposite of the way we are supposed to live as godly people. So, leading in love, living in love requires confrontation. And leading in love also requires maturity. Uh, it is difficult to know when to confront what to say, and when to leave it alone. Now, what's interesting is that, say, for a person who is um, under the authority of a pastor, if you're connected with the church, um, you're a member or you're a regular attender, you know, Scripture does expect you to listen to what is being taught from the pulpit where you go. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, and 13, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very high in love because of their work, be at peace among yourselves. It's kind of interesting, the couple there with the be at peace among yourselves, I don't think it's separate. I think one of the ways you have peace in a congregation is the congregation is devoted to God's teaching as God's teaching is being taught from the pulpit. I think that's a fundamental purpose of the church. However... You can have a problem, right? You can have preachers that um, are rude, are harsh, are angry. You can have preachers who, who perhaps are not teaching godly um, truth. All kinds of problems. 
Well, there are instructions within Scripture, lots of instructions for the way pastors are supposed to behave. And one of the most fundamental that I've always kind of kept close to my own heart is 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 3. So I exhort the elders among you as a feller, fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful game, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. I mean, it, it's, it's not enough to just be a mouthpiece. You, you have to live a particular way or try to live a particular way, and I think that's one of the reasons for the injunctions for, for elders and pastors and teachers that we find Paul giving to, in Timothy. You know, it's not so much there about how it's not so much there about what you do, it's more about who you are, really, when you look at a pastor. And that's a hard thing to live up to. And so, honestly, whenever I'm up here trying to teach or preach, I have a responsibility to understand that I'm guilty of many of the same things I'm talking about, I'm trying to encourage not to do. I recognize that I uh, have feet of clay, I have to uh, challenge and, and encourage and admonish and provide hope and compassion, and it's, it's a difficult thing. And knowing how to do that requires maturity, and particularly in understanding how to, how to confront sin, maybe not just in general, but in particular with another person. Uh, it requires a lot of maturity. I mean, when you come in hard, when you... you um, maybe come in a little more gently. How do you approach a person? What is their maturity? And i got to tell you, there are some times when I've tried to approach a problem or approach an issue, and it, it is not good what happens, and, and it's difficult. And this is all a part of leading in love, trying to, trying to find the right approach, the right way, the right understanding, so that you can talk to people about where they are. And this is important for all of us as individuals, too. You know, not just as pastors. I use that as an example, particularly because we're talking about Paul here. And Paul is their, their spiritual mother of the congregation. I mean, so he's trying to encourage them and, and confront them about doctrinal sin. I mean, pastors have to do that sometimes. But the way they go about it is very important, and you know how they go about it, and whether or not they name names or say things. I mean, my approach has always been to present what I believe to be solid biblical truth, and to trust the Spirit to use that solid biblical truth and the words of God to help a person to figure out what they're doing wrong in their lives. But when you're doing that directly to a person when you feel like you have to confront them as an individual because you love them and you want them to grow in their relationship with God, doing that the right way is important. And that's why leading in love and living in love requires maturity. So we, we have to pray to God. We have to ask Him for insight and wisdom so that when we do end up confronting someone or approaching someone, we're doing it in the right way way. And I think the final lesson I want to talk about this morning about leading in love is that leading in love or living in love requires us to be honest about the difficulties in our own lives. Um, and I honestly think this is a vital message that the American church needs to heed. Um, not only from so the so-called prosperity gospel that's out there, but there is an image that we tend to project, right? Um, everything, is, everything is perfect, everything is extravagant, everything is slick, everything is marketed. You know, if you look at the people up here on stage, you don't see the stained clothes, you don't know the heartache. Everything is a picture of perfection. But Paul reminds us in this passage that God works through difficult circumstances. And if we're honest about it, in truth, the difficult circumstances often seem to be the fertile soil for the spread of the gospel. And that's what we find over and over again in 2 Corinthians. And I want to pull three points out of 
2 Corinthians that I think are essential for our understanding of being real and being honest and not putting up a false front when we're talking to other people. And the first is this. Our perseverance in the face of suffering points others to the power of God within us. Once again, it's not all about us. It's about God and his work in our lives. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. In other words, we have trouble in life. We shouldn't try to hide it. We shouldn't try and gloss over it. We should be sharing about how God is at work in us, through it, and comforting us. And that is a way of sharing about what God has done for us with others. And troubles in our lives help us to rely on God's power, not our power. It's important to be honest about these things so people can see God working in our lives, but it's also important for us to have these difficulties in our lives because if we don't have these difficulties, we can think that we're awesome, we're great, everything's wonderful, and we're doing it all with our own guts and our determination, the American way, right? Not really that way. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need, my power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And Paul says the same thing slightly differently elsewhere in 2 Corinthians, where he details the hardships he has endured for the gospel. Um, this is 2 Corinthians 11, 24-30. Five time, different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I've worked hard and long, and during many sleepless nights I've been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. If I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. And how different is that than what the message we have in most of our churches today? It's about God. It goes back in the sense of the idea that Jesus is enough. You know, a corollary to that is it's all about God. It's not about how nice I look. It's not about what car I drive. It's not about the house I live in. It's not about my IRA. It's not about any of those things. It's all about God, and the difficulties come in our lives to remind us it's not about us. It's about God. It's about God. And then finally, I think the last lesson we can take from 2 Corinthians regarding this idea of suffering and affliction is that by getting through our suffering, we can help others who are going through suffering. This is what Paul says at the very beginning of the book. It's like he starts off with the theme and he continues it throughout the entire book of 2 Corinthians. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. 
Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that you share in our sufferings, uh, that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. So, by being real with people, by helping them to understand that we have trouble too, it becomes a way for us to reach out to them. We can share with them what God has done for us, what God is doing in us, how God has helped us, and how God can help them through His Spirit. But if God is going to help them through His Spirit, first of all, they have to believe in the one who He sent, Jesus Christ. So living in love requires us in the church to confront sin and to be real with one another. But it also means that in the world, if we truly love people and want to introduce them to the God we know and love and serve, we have to let them know that they're sinners just like we are. That the difference is we believe in the one who can take away that sin. So this idea of living in love and being willing to confront those who aren't following God with the truth is for the world as well as for our brothers and sisters. Are we willing to stand up for the gospel and say that Jesus is enough? Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for what you have done for us through Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is enough. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us to be real in our own lives, real about our struggles, our problems, because everybody has problems and struggles. And by being real about ours and how you have helped us through them, we can help other people know that you will help them too. And dear Heavenly Father, help us to have the maturity that we need in talking to a brother or sister or in talking to someone from the world to, to help them to understand that they need to follow you. We pray for the guidance and direction of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We, we know that the Spirit is there. You promise to give us your Spirit. Your Spirit helps us to believe and follow. Help us to rely upon the guidance of your Spirit to know what to say and how to say it and when to say it when we are confronting people with their sin. And help us to be willing to confront because love requires confrontation. Because we desperately want our brothers and sisters to follow you better. And we desperately want others in this world to know Jesus Christ, and to realize that he is enough. And it's in his precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.